Welcome to Interlochen Center for the Arts. I'm Peter Payette. I run Interlochen Public Radio, and it's a real privilege for me tonight to welcome you here on behalf of the whole Interlochen community to an evening with Susan Goldberg, brought to us by the International Affairs Forum. It's a real honor for this institution to host the International Affairs Forum on this special night. Susan uh, spent some time on our campus this afternoon, and she said something that caught my attention. She said she used the word reverence to describe the attitude that people, many people have toward National Geographic. And I really liked that because I thought that's exactly right. And it was refreshing since there's so much negativity and controversy around journalism these days and the prospects for journalism. It was a nice reminder that National Geographic is a very bright light in the world of journalism. And as you'll hear tonight, it continues to burn even brighter. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And I must say, as a native Michigander, I am so delighted to be back in northern Michigan, which is one of my favorite places on the planet. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, not only is it beautiful and it's relaxing, and I love coming here every summer, but I was reminded how nice everybody is from here when I walked into my cabin and I opened the refrigerator, and there was some smoked whitefish dip, <laughs> which is one of my favorite foods I had revealed to the ticker before I came here. So I think it might have been Karen who put that in there, so thank you very much. Uh, well, tonight I want to talk about National Geographic and the reinvention of this amazing brand for the 21st century. So I'll tell you a story. If you are the editor of National Geographic, people tell you three things, and they're always the same three things. And the first one is that they all want to be a National Geographic photographer. <laughs> and of course, who can blame them? Uh, <laughs> hello, my name is Charlie Hamilton James, and today I'm on assignment for National Geographic. And that is really what it is like. They are amazing people who get to do amazing things. The second is that Somebody will tell you that, oh, their grandfather has 5,000 pounds <laughs> of National Geographics in the attic or in the basement, and um, I will give you all permission to recycle. <laughs> and the third thing, and I don't have a slide for this, is if you are a man of a certain age, you will tell me <laughs> very quietly that it was in National Geographic that you saw your first female breasts. <laughs> Not only will you tell me the fact, but you will tell me when and where and the names, <laughs> the names of the other boys you were with. And you will whisper this because you will think, nobody has ever told me this before. <laughs> but you will be wrong. So those are the things people think they know about National Geographic. But the truth is, National Geographic is a really cool brand that is a modern brand. And I'm going to tell you some of the things you don't know about National Geographic. For example, we have more storytelling assets than essentially any other media company. Everything from live events and trips to a huge digital business, a television business, a magazine business, a book business, you name it. So we have a way to tell stories across platforms that nobody else does. And that's a lot of what I am going to be talking about tonight. And just to give you a sense of the scale of it all, our television business is in more than 150 countries. It's one of the most distributed cable brands in the world. Our magazine reaches more than 70 million people each month. We publish about 15 different magazines 
the big magazine, National Geographic, kids magazines, travel magazines. We publish in 33 languages. And that other number, which is what I'm going to spend the most time on, because it's the future of our business. We have more than 420 million fans on social media, which makes us the media company with the largest reach into the digital sphere. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. The other thing that people don't know, and I just always feel I should let people know, is that we give 27% of the profits of National Geographic back to the nonprofit National Geographic Society, where they're invested in science, exploration, and education. And so when those National Geographic explorers find something amazing, like some fossils that can tell us about the origins of humankind, we will write those stories, you will consume those stories, we will profit from those stories, and then those profits are again plowed back. So it is a wonderful, virtuous circle. But increasingly, this is how people are reading those stories. And this is a great opportunity, I think, for us to reach the next generation of readers and users. I also think it's an opportunity to create a new intimacy with readers because their lives don't live in the yellow border of our print magazine, but their lives do live on that device that each and every one of us carries 24 seven, and we use it to tell our own stories to our friends, our families, and our colleagues. So when we look at those small screens, what kind of stories are we seeing in National Geographic? Well, Sometimes we are seeing epic stories, like this picture taken by Charlie Hamilton James, that guy who was getting mauled by the elephant. This is at Yellowstone, and it was for a special magazine we produced a couple of years ago about Yellowstone in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. I just have loved this picture. Or they're gonna read stories like this. This is a young girl named Yoena, and she is a member of a very little contacted tribe living in the Brazilian rainforest. And her tribe is threatened increasingly by logging and development, and there's a big debate going on about how we can protect these people. Sometimes we have to tell people hard and sad stories, like this. The slaughter of elephants and rhinos is a story that National Ge Geographic needs to keep shining a spotlight on because nobody else will. Nobody else is going to report that 100,000 elephants have been killed in the last three years by poachers for their ivory and that rhinos are being driven nearly into extinction. And another story we need to keep reporting is on climate change. Now this is a beautiful photograph in many ways taken by Paul Nicklin, one of our Arctic underwater photographers. Um, and this is in Antarctica. And while it is beautiful, it is also sad because this is a dying glacier. This is a disintegrating dying glacier. And we need to tell people the science around what is going on with climate change and report the facts of it and keep telling that story until people listen. So when people are consuming all of this on their phones, you know, they could be looking at Facebook or Twitter, but very often they're looking at Instagram. We have more than 91 million followers on our main National Geographic account, at Nat Geo, maybe we could get a few more. <laughs> so at Nat Geo is our main Instagram account, and um, it is the largest non-celebrity account on Instagram. So we are not as big as Kim Kardashian, <laughs> but I do think we're gonna give her a run for her money. So I decided I would take a look at what are some of the most popular, most liked photos that we've put up lately on Instagram. And there was this one. So this is a picture of a baby harp seal taken by Brian Scary, another underwater photographer. And the reason I think that the Instagram account really connects with people is because the authentic voices of our photographers comes through in those captions. And here Brian is telling the story of why sea ice is so important and how threatened species like this are by climate change. And this had 664,000 likes. Then, 
I ran into this one. This is a picture taken by Amy Vitale, one of our wildlife photographers, and she had gone to China for us a few years ago to do a story about how the Chinese government is breeding pandas and then rewilding them, putting them back out into the jungles because this is a very endangered species. And Amy did a wonderful story and took a number of completely adorable pictures of baby pandas, 735,000 likes. But even more liked than those two was this one. This was, I think, one of the most liked pictures of, of the year. This is a baby emperor penguin taken by Paul Nicklin, who again uses the platform to talk about the importance of sea ice and the threat of climate change. So OK, what does this tell us? Well, people like pictures of baby animals. But I think it's fascinating that a lot grittier content also works really well on Instagram and on the phone. So this is a picture from an expedition we launched a few years ago where we sent a writer, a photographer, a videographer, and three mountaineers to scale the highest peak in Southeast Asia. It's in Myanmar. And they didn't make it. The expedition fell apart. They ran out of food. They turned on each other. It was ugly. It was awful. And as our photographer, Corey Richards, says in this caption, sunburned, filthy, and exhausted after months in the jungle, climbing mountains, and the slow, steady stripping of social niceties, the reduction to our most basic and raw existence. And more, more than 250,000 people liked this. And almost 190,000 people liked this picture of our emaciated mountaineers. So I use this as an example because a few months later, this is what that story looked like in the opening spread of National Geographic magazine. And I've always really loved this, um, this headline and, and this subhead, Point of No Return, How a Forgotten Peak Rising from the Jungles of Myanmar Nearly Broke an Elite Team of Mountaineers. And I like this example because increasingly, this is how we're telling stories. Stories will start on one of our digital platforms, in this case, Instagram. And then a few months later, we'll build them up, and they will become stories in the magazine. And that is how we're telling stories in real time and giving people information in real time on the platform where they want to get it. So the fourth thing that people ask you when you're the editor of National Geographic, after they get over some of those other personal things, is how do you decide what stories to tell? And when I came to National Geographic about five years ago, I started thinking about this a lot. And the second uh, editor and president of National Geographic was Alexander Graham Bell, the famous Alexander Graham Bell. And his theory was that we should cover the world and everything in it. Well, I thought, wow, that is so big, that is completely paralyzing. So we came up instead with these five storytelling principles. And I want every piece of content that we produce on whatever platform to hit at least one of these principles, if not more than one of them. And so let's talk about how that plays out. So the first one is, we want to do stories that make a difference, right? Stories that matter, stories that can move the needle, stories that can touch people's hearts or that can get them to take action to make the world a better place. And I am really happy that about this cover, which is our cover in June. We started looking at the really plastic apocalypse that is going on in the world. Um, we want to engage our readers in an effort to cut back their use of single-use plastics. And in fact, we started at, in our own backyard. We no longer deliver our magazine in a plastic wrapper, but instead are using a paper wrapper. And even our cafeteria no longer has plastic forks. We have wooden forks. Now, I have to admit they don't work nearly as well. But, but it's important, I think, to start there. So we are on this plastics campaign 
And I thought that we really needed to tell people the full story of plastic because people don't really know. And one of the first things that you need to acknowledge about plastic is it's an incredible invention. You know, it helped us win World War II. It saves lives every day. It's hard for any of us to imagine our lives without plastic. And I've always really liked this picture that we ran from Life magazine from the mid-1950s. You know, it's a picture of, you know, housewife saying, oh, I don't have to wash dishes anymore. I don't have that drudgery. I can just throw it all away. And I know a lot of us grew up kind of thinking the same thing. But this is what happens to that plastic. So we sent reporter Laura Parker and photographer Randy Olson around the world to find out what happens as a result of our convenient lifestyle. And one of the things that happens with these plastic bags is they end up here in India, where it is the job of this woman and her son to collect them, to wash them, to bundle them, to take them to a recycler. That is our convenience. And this is our convenience. And after I saw this picture, I thought I could never drink out of a plastic bottle again. Occasionally I fall off the wagon, but I am really trying. So this is also taken in India. And this little girl, who I guess is about seven or eight years old, is there with her mother and her brother. And their job is to separate the plastic bottles by color and to tear off those labels so they can be bundled up again and taken to a recycler. And this picture from the Philippines. These are plastic bottles off the streets of Manila. And these guys are making a living taking them to recycling. And that sounds kind of positive. I keep saying recycling, recycling, recycling. But the truth of it is, only 10% of the plastic that could be recycled in the United States is actually recycled. And 20% of the plastic globally is actually recycled. And plastic is everywhere. So we looked at the story photographically that way, and then we started looking also at the impact on animals, because we know our readers care very much. And you know, this was a picture that just went viral. And so did this one of a loggerhead turtle. Thousands and probably millions of animals are killed every year because they run into something like this discarded fisherman's net. Now, the one good thing I can tell you about this picture is this particular turtle was freed because the photographer cut it out. And this stork in Spain also was freed by the photographer. But, you know, these plastic bags are insidious because they can kill time and time again. If this photographer hadn't come along, that bird surely would have died, and its body eventually would have dis disintegrated. And then the plastic bag would have floated off, perhaps to trap another victim. So we are really on a campaign, and we are pulling out all the stops. We have created an, an, a campaign on our Instagram account to try to draw attention to the scourge of plastic. It's called it's a hashtag campaign, hashtag planet or plastic. You can take a look at it. We, we, uh, enlisted stars and social media influencers to help us with this. This is Zoe Deschanel. You know, Ellen DeGeneres retweeted this right after she tweeted it. And so we are trying to do everything we can to make a difference. And I think plastic is a great example of a story to, that makes a difference. Next. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we need to do stories that nobody else can do because they don't have our crazy ambition, they don't have our amazing visuals, or maybe they don't have the time and money to invest in our journalism. So this is our September cover, and I'm very proud of it. It took us several years to tell it, and it is called The Story of a Face, and it is the story of a young woman who lost her face and how she received a face transplant at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we spent more than two years essentially embedded with her and her family, with uh, photographers and reporters. 
and we were given just complete access by this family to tell this story and complete access by the Cleveland Clinic. It was a significant investment, but it's also a significant and important story. And I have a short video just to tell you about it. And this story ran all across our platforms. This was a, this is a teaser for how it looked on television. A groundbreaking face transplant. Thank you for this opportunity. Gave Katie Stubblefield a second chance at life. When you go through something like this, there's not much you take for granted anymore. This is her story. That's great. <laughs> Katie's new face. Premier event next Saturday at 9 on National Geographic. So that was uh, part of a video that we made about this family. Uh, this story ran in our magazine, so this was how it started. And then when you flipped open the page, and this is a bit of a shocking photo for people who haven't seen it, this is what you see. So our photographer was in this, and reporter, were in the operating room for 31 hours. And sort of the unsung hero of this story is not only this young woman who died, but the grandmother of this young woman who agreed to donate her face to Katie Stubblefield. That is an amazing gift to give another person. And that is the story we told, and we told it with a 9,000-word magazine story that became our single best-read piece of content this year. We told it in this video that not only was on our television station, but was our best video on YouTube this year. We created what we call a tapumentary that is for social platforms like Snapchat. And here we're telling the story of teen suicide because the reason Katie lost her face was she tried to kill herself. She shot her face off. And it's a terrible story and it's a hard story, but it's an important story because teen suicide is the second leading cause of death of teenagers. And so we told this story to the audience that needed to hear about it. And we also created an interactive version of the story for phones and for Instagram. And it is the best, most popular story we have ever done on Instagram. So I am really honored by the reaction to this story because it's a story of a brave girl and it's a story of the human journey and medical miracles, but it's really a story about resilience and a family's love. And if that is not a good story, I don't know what is. Next, we want to do stories that are part of the conversation. We don't just want to show beautiful pictures of landscapes. We need to be urgent and on the news, but in a very national geographic way. So for 130 years, we've been covering the human journey. And in January of 2017, we decided that we were going to cover gender. And we went all over the world talking to people about the impact that gender has in their life. We talked to 89-year-olds on eight continents, and we said, what's it like to be a boy in your country? What is it like to be a girl in your country? What if you were somebody of the other gender? And that is how we came to meet Avery Jackson, a nine-year-old transgender girl from St. Louis, Missouri, and we put her on the cover because not only is it an incredible portrait by Robin um, Hammond, our photographer, but because Avery said something so profound about gender that seemed to be at the heart of so much of the conversation. She said, the best thing about being a girl is now I don't have to pretend to be a boy. And we just thought, wow, that is amazing. So after National Geographic, a revered brand, put a nine-year-old transgender girl on the cover, not all of our readers liked it. In fact, <laughs> I got a lot of mail. A number of readers didn't like it, and some didn't like it so much they canceled. In fact, 10,000 people canceled their subscriptions to the magazine. 
And you know, reasonable people can disagree about what's, a, what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate, and I respect readers' views. The only readers I was really disappointed in were the ones who returned the magazine to me, still sealed in the then plastic bag that it came in. They wouldn't even open it. And it made me sad because I thought if they would have opened it, they would have seen that we covered this the way we cover everything, through incredible visuals, through fact-based, science-based journalism, and with a global viewpoint. So I mentioned all of those kids we talked to all over the world. I'd like to show you what they had to say. Um, my name is Hilti Kate Leeshack. I'm nine years old. I am nine years old. And I'm nine years old. The best thing being a girl is, be is because that girls can do a little bit more things than boys can. Boys are better than girls because they can, they're really strong than girls. The best thing about being a girl is now I don't have to pretend to be a boy. I can just be a girl. You get to wear makeup. The worst thing about being a girl is that you just can't do things that boys can do. The worst thing about being a boy is your underarm pit stinks. Like, it kind of bothers me how there, there was not one girl president. Eu acho que na aparência são um pouco mais diferenciadas. If I was a girl, my life would be very strange and odd. The hair always comes in your face. It would be very, very irritating with the long hair. In my kibak, I can sell you a crap. If I was a girl, um, I would have to play with Barbies. Um, I won't be able to play boy games. É, eu não posso tipo me envolver nos segredos nas meninas. Well, there's not many things I can do as a girl. There's like barely anything I can do. Something that makes me sad is thinking of my dad killing another animal because it's like a person. I used to go to my dad's house, and then one day he left me on the porch. I got bullied before at school, and then after that, I never saw him again. He just pushed me against the wall, then left without saying sorry. If I could change sort of the world, I would stop people from bowling. I would make the roads able to fit four cars so there would be less traffic. Muito agressividade nas ruas, assim, muito terror nas ruas. E mãe que eu gosto de uma tibana, é que eu vou ter que amar o caminho que eu vou ter que ver. I would not change anything because I like what I have and what I don't have. A chocolate um, house, I would live in that house and I would eat it every day. So you have to appreciate what you have than what you don't have. When I grow up, I want to be a professional golfer. The first Indian president. I want to be a Navy SEAL. I want to be a fan of that. It's not good at that. I'm not going to be a fan. I want to be a professor who knows everything. I want to be a dentist. I want to be a dentist, banker, or a computer-like genius guy. I'm going to be a dentist to get a pizza. I am going to help kids have good teeth, not have cavities. Yay, we're done! <laughs> well, <laughs> you can see why we wanted to talk to nine-year-olds, because they really do tell you what's on their mind. But 
One of the things that I found so incredibly disturbing about these interviews is the number of girls, and these were done in 2017, the number of girls who talk about how their gender is going to prevent them from doing something. She couldn't be a rabbi, she couldn't herd livestock. Not all of the girls said this, but so many girls said it in different languages from different socioeconomic groups, and the fact that that is still happening in 2017, it, it basically makes me insane. Okay, another cover that we did and another special issue that we did that was really part of the conversation was this April we did a cover on race and we kicked off a year of stories looking at race and diversity in America. And the reason we did it in April was April was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. So it seemed like a really good time to step back and take stock of where are we in the country on the subject of race. And you know, this, the conversation in the United States around race has gotten very ugly and very pointed. And we were all struck after Charlottesville just how ugly that conversation had become. So we decided to set out to do this issue and then this year-long series of stories. But before we did that, we had to do a hard thing. And that was we had to look at ourselves. National Geographic is 130 years old. We came up at the height of colonialism, and that was the viewpoint through which we covered the world. And uh, I wrote this letter to readers recounting that history because I really didn't think we could credibly cover the subject of race, we couldn't credibly look at how other people were dealing with race if we weren't willing to look at our own history in a very transparent way. So I, thank you. You know, and it, and it was a hard story because we're really proud of a lot of the history of National Geographic, but we're not proud of this part of our history. Because what I found after I asked a historian to come and look at our archives was that when it came to covering people of color in the United States, that we basically ignored them until the 1970s, the only people of color almost ever acknowledged in our magazine was if they were laborers or domestic workers. And when we went overseas, we tended to exoticize people, and in the most stereotypical ways, happy warriors, you know, or happy natives, fierce warriors, that kind of thing, without really getting at the humanity of the people. So we really needed to take a hard look at this. And I think I was a little naive when I wrote it, but this story went completely nuts online. 300 million people came to this story and the rest of our race content, and it sparked an incredible conversation that I am really proud we are still having. And the issue itself was amazing. I mean, we looked at the science of race, which is to say there is no science of race. We are all the same under our skin. We looked at the amazing diversity of people. This is a project by a photographer who takes people and puts them on these paint chips that reflect their skin tone, and it's, it's such a visual and interesting way to look at the diversity of the world. We looked at the rising anxiety that is going on among a lot of white people. Uh, you know, sometimes when we say race, and if we're white, we think that's everybody else, right? But we have to look at what's going on with white people too, because our country is changing in real time. In 2020, for the first time, the majority of people under 18 will not be white. They will be African-American, they'll be Latino, they'll be Asian-American, they will not be white, the majority of people. And so this is a conversation going on in real time and a lot of people feel very threatened. Another story we did in the issue that you know, we got some feedback was not a very National Geographic story, was a story about police stops. But I didn't know how could we write about race if we couldn't cover the one thing that more people of color talk about becomes the sometimes fatal flashpoint and becomes a, this is how the conversation about race in the United States gets played out around these stops. 
but we also had much more positive stories. This is a picture taken from Spelman University, and we don't see enough pictures of striving, thriving African-American young people. And we don't see enough of these pictures. We parked our photographer outside City Hall at Brooklyn and just said, stay here for a couple of days and see who gets married. And he came back with just an amazing number of pictures of people of all races getting married to each other. It's very interesting. You know, in 1965, about 5% of marriages in the United States were of interracial couples. Now it's almost 20%. And so, you know, that is a much more positive story about the racial conversation that's going on in the United States. So that was our issue about race, and we have continued it throughout the year uh, in our, we've, we've done uh, Latinos, we did, um, uh, Native Americans, we've done Asian Americans, we've looked at it from all directions. And just this last week, to close the series, I was honored to interview Congressman John Lewis. You know, Congressman Lewis uh, from Georgia, who I think, as you probably know, was, is the only living person to have spoken at the 1963 March on Washington. He is the only, he's the last one left. And he is, was just amazing in the things that he said about why we should have hope that things are getting better in our country were really inspirational. So our next storytelling principle, and this is certainly true in everybody's business, is to act urgently. And people think it's kind of funny for a monthly magazine to act urgently. But now, of course, we have all of these platforms that we can use to act urgently. So we have a reporter who is walking around the world. He is tracing the path of earliest man. So he started in Ethiopia, and he is on a 21,000-mile, 10-year walk, and he never goes home. He's going all the way, starting in Ethiopia, and he's going to end up at the tip of South America. And when he was walking along the border of Turkey and Syria with our photographer, John Stanmeyer, Right in front of him, all of these Syrian refugees came flooding, literally running into Turkey, of course, fleeing ISIS, fleeing the terrible civil war. So because we have a website, we immediately wrote about this on our website. And then a few months later, we wrote about a much bigger story about the refugee situation going on all over the world. And I am so struck by John's photo. You know, you look at this picture, and you see that little boy, and you see this family, and it tells you everything you need to know about why this refugee crisis is an enormous global humanitarian crisis. There are more refugees now than at any time since World War II. And this is another story you're going to see more of in National Geographic. We have to tell the stories of what is happening to these people. And our last storytelling principle is you have to know who you are. Why do people come to National Geographic? Well, a lot of people come because they want to know more about the natural world and specifically about animals. And let me show you this project by Joel Sartori. It is called the Photo Arc. And it is a 25-year project by Joel, who is a great photographer, who aims to take pictures of the 12,000 species of animals that are in captivity. And he takes these beautiful portraits. And the reason he's doing it is because if we stay on the road that we're on, by 2100, half of those species will be extinct from this Earth. So Joel takes these pictures very simply. They're always either on a black background or a white background. And most of the time, the animal is making contact with the viewer. And he's doing it because all of the animals are important, and he wants you to know that. And what I love about Joel's project is he doesn't just take pictures of the charismatic animals, right? So it's not just the lions or the tigers or the bears. But he takes pictures of the little animals that nobody ever thinks about, like the rats. <laughs> Cutest rat ever, though. <laughs> 
and the snails and the frogs. And we love Joel's project so much that a few years ago, we put it on the cover of National Geographic, except we couldn't decide which picture we loved the most. So we created 10 different covers that were distributed randomly. So if you had a subscription, you might have gotten the tiger, but maybe you got the koala bear. And so we had a lot of fun with that. And this is content that appears across all of our platforms. We have a photo arc book that was our best-selling book last year, and we're doing more of them. This has appeared in our kids' magazine. It appears all the time on our website as part of our animal reference material. And if you go look at our videos on nationalgeographic.com, you'll see this. So what Joel says is, if I can get them to fall in love, if I can get them to care, I can get them to take action. And that is a great mission statement for everything we want to do at National Geographic. Now I mentioned that we're trying to appeal to people of all ages. So a lot of younger people, like teenagers, won't go to nationalgeographic.com, but they do look at Snapchat. So here's how that same story looks, at, looks on Snapchat, and we have about five million young people every month looking at our content on Snapchat. So you have to know who you are. And these, this is why people come to National Geographic. These are our best-selling covers in the last five years. I think that the face cover will be up here shortly, but I don't have all the statistics on that yet. And it makes me happy because these are stories about human cultures, and these are stories about science, and these are stories that help tell people about the world and how to make it a better place, a place where we understand each other better. That is really our mission. So let me just close with a video about National Geographic, and then I'm excited to talk to Peter and take your questions. can make a difference. The world needs a lot more conservationists and a lot more scientists. We think we know this place, but we don't. We think we understand how things work, but we don't. That's why exploration is so fundamentally important. It's about telling a story that resonates with all sorts of people all over the world. Ah, ha! Charles, 
It's the elation that you get by saving a life. Dude, you're not that much older. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it doesn't matter if I can't feel my fingers. It doesn't matter how my face stings and feels like it's getting sandblasted. It matters that somebody else can feel that by looking at a picture. The most important message is that every individual matters and every individual makes a difference every day. So it was very unsatisfying sitting and watching your uh, slides on the little monitor back there. Oh, get used to it. Everybody, you know, you should be used to it from the phone. But when that, <laughs> when that woman's face was laying on the table, everyone leaned in on that photo. It, it, it is absolutely a, remarkable. It is a startling picture. It was taken by photojournalist Lynn Johnson. And she said, actually, that it was a moment of reverence in the operating room. And you can kind of see it in that picture with, she said, all of a sudden, it got very quiet. And the doctors huddled around that face. And um, you know, before they took it off, took it, took it away to give it to Katie. And it's, it's just an amazing story. How did that, where did that story start? The story started because I used to be the editor of The Plain Dealer uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and I got to know a lot of people at the Cleveland Clinic, including the CEO. And when I ran into him a few years after I had uh, left, left The Plain Dealer, he and I started talking about, was there some project that we could do together, you know, uh, where we could embed some of our journalists with some of their doctors while they did something amazing? And he said, let me get back to you. And what he did was he went and he talked to this family, because he knew this was coming. And he said, would you be willing to open up your life this way? And the next thing I knew, I was on a plane back to Cleveland, and I met the Stubblefields, you know, Rob and Elisa Stubblefield, and Katie, of course. And um, I, needed to, I needed to talk to them about the story. They needed to trust us, of course, with this incredibly intimate story, but I also needed to make sure that would they, how would they handle, you know, a reporter there all the time and a photographer there all the time and what was a really difficult situation on a lot of days. And they were just the most amazing people and they welcomed us into their family and that is how we were able to tell that story. Yeah, astonishing work. So we, we do not have very many questions yet. We would love to hear from you. I will... Uh, I'll, I'll have to tell you the ways you can pose a question. You could email it to content at interlochen.org. Uh, you can just go to the Interlochen Facebook page and post your question there, or you can use the hashtag interlochenarts. Or you're going to have to work really hard. Or I'll just have to keep <laughs> this going. So you mentioned you publish in 33 languages. Since this is an international affairs forum event, maybe you could talk a little bit about your interactions with communities of people across the world and what the state of the world community is like based on the perspective you have. Well, it's really interesting. So in all of those countries where we publish, we have an, an editor you know, and then his or her staff. And the way it works is that they are essentially our licensees, so they can use any of the content that we put out in English that is then translated into the local language, but they can also use their own local content and create their own local content as long as it sort of fits our general guidelines. And one of the things I love every month, and you know, I should do a slide on this, is what, what the covers look like in those 33 languages. Um, because often, 
they will use the same uh, photo and the same story that we've used for our cover, but sometimes they won't. For example, when we did the gender issue, the, our Russian local language edition, they weren't going there. There was like no way. But it surprised me, uh, other, other places did use it. And in fact, our issue that comes out in Iran um, created its own gender cover, and they did a drawing that represented an Iranian fable, sort of about how men and women are two sides of the, of the same coin. So I thought it was really fascinating how they chose to, to deal with it in, in different countries. And every month, I get to see that. And I love talking to our editors all over the world. They are a great sounding board. and. Um, incredibly helpful as we strive to make decisions that make sense across much of the globe. Do you have any sense how the emerging nationalism and tribalism in this world is affecting how people perceive what you're doing? Or? Well, I don't know for sure, but it's interesting you should say that because we are going to start a series of stories about democracy and what's happening to democracy. You know, you know, leading up to the 2020 election and even leading up to these midterms, this is obviously a gigantic um, topic of conversation and not just in our country but around the world. So we will look globally at what's going on in parts of Europe, what's happening in the Middle East. There, there are some bright spots out there, countries like Tunisia, but there's a lot of bad stuff happening uh, everywhere. So the students today asked some good questions. I, I took a couple of them down. One wondered if you are not tempted or if you don't get, uh, take more of a side in the issues that you report on. And you said, no, we don't. We are, uh, we are independent, and we maintain an independent point of view. And I'm, I wonder uh, if how challenging that is these days, if it's becoming more challenging. Some people question whether that's even a, uh, a legitimate position to claim you are in. I know. That's become a, a thing that some people say there cannot be any impartiality and that there cannot be objectivity. But I fundamentally, down to my toes, disagree with that. Um, I, I think we can be impartial and we can report factual content. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody gets 50-50. So when we report on climate change, we're not going to spend half of the story talking to the people who say it isn't even happening because, you know, <laughs> because 99% of the legitimate scientists in the world say that it is. So, you know, you can always acknowledge that some people don't agree with that, but then you move on with your story. But I, I do worry. Um, about the rise, really, of opinion journalism and how much so many people are gravitating to that rather than really the fact-based, more impartial journalism that I think is uh, under, underpins our democracy and helps people make informed decisions. Were you surprised that 10,000 people canceled their subscriptions after the gender issue? I was surprised that 10,000 people canceled. I figured some people would cancel. At 10,000, I thought, wow, that's a lot. But, you know, we have millions of subscribers, and um, I guess I thought it was much more important that actually in the gender issue, 400 million people came to that gender content across our digital platforms for around the world because people heard about it. You know, it was, um, it was well reported. We had a lot of press around it. We did a lot of press around it. And it made me really proud to be able to be a spokesperson for National Geographic to tell people about the kinds of stories that we're covering and why we're covering them. So I I, you know, of course, I didn't want anybody to cancel, but I don't think it was a terrible thing. Has there has there been any backlash uh, approaching that degree for anything else you've done? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> what was there I'm any? Was that there was any? bad. That was. I shouldn't be flipped. That was a bad answer. <laughs> What's the next issue? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, you're always going to do stories, and you know, 
some people are going to like some more than others, and there are going to be some people who think all you should ever cover are landscapes and animals. And you know, I accept that, but I, I think we do cover landscapes and animals, but I think we need to cover other things too and be part of that conversation and be relevant to what people are talking about today. I believe that is really the highest fulfillment of our role. So this is a question I was wondering. How on earth do you get the job of being the editor at National Geographic? <laughs> The, um, the, the scope of that enterprise was uh, sounds dizzying. Well, How do you get there? It was. It's. I always tell people it was a total shock that I became the editor because um, I'm not a photojournalist. I right. I came up the word side of the business. Uh, I'd never worked for a magazine before, and I'm not a guy. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a complete startling, amazing thing that I got this job. No, I was minding my own business. I was. Uh, the executive editor at Bloomberg News. I ran our Washington bureau. I, I was in charge of our local, state, and federal government coverage for around the country. And one day the phone rang, and it was a headhunter saying, you know, there's this job at National Geographic. And it wasn't the top editor job at the time. It was one, one rung lower. And so the headhunter called me, and she tried very hard to talk me out of it. She said, you know, there's this job at National Geographic, but you know, it's really a lateral move at best, and you'd have to take a big pay cut, and you don't really want it. And I'm like, wait a minute, did you say National Geographic? <laughs> so you know, I insisted that I go over there. And uh, then very shortly thereafter, I was promoted to the editor job. And you mentioned. <laughs> mostly uh, white men working there, you said, today, when you got there. Was being a woman, was, was that, I mean, that affect your work or come into your I imagine daily it does. routine? In a, <laughs> it does come into my daily routine. Someone's asking how it feels to be the, the first woman editor at National Geographic. Well, you know, it feels like being an editor, right? Because I don't know how to be an editor who's not a woman. Uh, I, I, <laughs> it just, it's, it's just part of the package. So, you know, what I think, though, is interesting is, uh, so I'll be 60 years old next year. And because of my age and how um, you know, society has changed. I have been the first woman a whole bunch of times. You know, I was the first woman in 1984 when the Detroit Free Press sent me to Lansing to cover the legislature and the governor. And it's distressing that that was a first in 1984 because that should have happened in 1934. But I was the first female editor of the San Jose Mercury News and of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. So by the time I got to be the first female editor of um, National Geographic, um, you know, I was sort of used to some people's surprise, and that's OK that they're surprised. Um, you know, I feel, I feel really honored and humbled to have the career I have had. But I know that this world is going to be a better place when I am not the first anything. And when having a woman in charge, whether it's in banking or law or politics or journalism, is just the normal course of events rather than some oddity. That is where we have to go. So someone wants to know the significance of the iconic yellow border. Is there a story there? You know, uh, I'm sure there is, but I'm really embarrassed to say <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> I'm going to find out, though, um, because now I'm really ashamed I don't know it. Um, you know, when National Geographic started, when I look, when you look at the first issue of National Geographic in 1888, it's it's brown. It looks like a brown paper bag, and there are no pictures in it, and it is filled with incredibly serious, earnest, and because I'm not a scientist, completely impenetrable science stories. And it wasn't until like you know, after 1900 that photographs started getting incorporated into the magazine. And in 1906, there's this great story. Um, there were a whole bunch of photographs put in because we had the first photographs that showed off flash photography. And they were pictures of animals uh, in Africa taken at night. And two members of the board quit because they said there were too many pictures and it was becoming a dumbed down picture book. So. <laughs> Talk about being on the wrong side of history. But I will find out about where, and, and the yellow border came in, I don't know, within about the first 10 years, but I don't know why. But I will find out. Okay. Uh, there's an interest in knowing if there will be continued reporting about the war on science. 
You know, I, I think that is such an important story. Um, and I'm re I was really happy that that turned out to be one of our best-selling covers because it's really concerning when people won't believe factual information because they claim it's political. And I think the only thing that we can do as a news organization that's on the side of science and on the side of facts is to really push back against that and to keep writing the fact-based, science-based stories and to, tr and to really tackle it head on. I mean, I think it is very important that we challenge and push back the um, insistence that you know, any information somebody doesn't like is somehow political. I, that's just crazy. There was a very astute question, I thought, from a student today who asked if science is such a, a great bulwark against ignorance, why was National Geographic writing things 75 years ago that you call appalling today? Well, I think those weren't the science-based stories, right? Those were the stories that tried to look at, that looked at cultures, but did so in a way that was very standard for its time, but that we look at now and we find offensive. But the problem really, and our, uh, the historian I asked to look at our archives pointed out that National Geographic, unlike magazines like Life Magazine, which really did cover desegregation and really did cover apartheid, we didn't do a very good job covering that. And um, you know, sometimes it's not just what you see, but what you choose knowingly not to see. He pointed out a story that we did in South Africa in 1962 during the height of apartheid, and there were no black voices in that story. There, were, there was no recognition of the oppression that was going on. There was no acknowledgment that a horrible massacre had taken place in Sharpeville um, where the people, you know, 69 people I think it was, were killed running away from the police. Uh, so those st the stories didn't even acknowledge that. And so it's hard to understand how that happened. And uh, I think what, what I can do now is say it did happen, acknowledge it happened, be really transparent about it, and put a stake in the ground to say, we're not doing that anymore. We haven't done that for a long time. And one of our main goals is to make sure we have a much more diverse workforce of writers and photographers who we're sending out in the world so they are seeing through, through clearer eyes what's really going on. So someone is asking, uh, I'll read it. It must be difficult to balance being urgent with producing long form deep dive stories. How do you strike and maintain that balance on all your platforms? You know, it, it is hard, but it's not always as hard as people think. You can kind of, if you're, if you're paying attention, you can listen to what people are talking about. Like we all know there's gonna be an election in November of 2020, and we all know that, um, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote. And we know that how women will vote in our election is gonna be the topic of a year of conversation, right? It's already a topic and it's gonna, I think the volume will ratchet up on that. Well, we're gonna do a special issue on women in January of 2020 and create a year of content around women taking a global look at the lives of women and you know, I think that seems urgent, that will seem really topical, but you can see it coming. So a lot of stories you can see coming. So you mentioned that you were excited uh, that a certain issue sold well. Is, is um, our, our uh, s sales right off the newsstand still a key part of? The business? Well, you know, so the newsstand is an increasingly troubled place, right? It's harder to even find where to buy a magazine on a newsstand. I mean, when you've got Barnes & Noble, which was one of our, our biggest purveyors of magazines, closing stores left and right, it gets, it gets harder and harder to find um, find magazines. That said, I, it's, so it's a tiny part of our circulation. It's a less than 10%. Well, well less than 10, much less than 10%. But it's... I always thought it was in, it's indicative because if you're doing really well on a newsstand, it tells you that you've really connected with an audience. And it's so humbling and so hard because you've got 
less than that amount of time to get somebody who's just wandering by to stop, to look, to read, and to understand and go, that's cool, I want to buy it. Here's $6.99. And it's really hard. And man, you know, it's just, it kind of hurts your heart sometimes when you think you've just got the greatest story out there and then you know, you might get a lot of great reaction from your subscribers, but it totally fails on the newsstand. It's just like, oh, bummer. Is it, so sales of magazines is a better indicator than traffic on your digital platforms? I think they're different indicators, and they're, and they're different audiences. I don't think that we have a huge overlap between the people who are reading us in our print edition and, say, people reading us on Snapchat. Uh, where I do think we've got more overlap, say, is in an Instagram audience because it's a mass audience. You know, it's a huge audience, and our, you know, and our our magazine is a huge audience too. But I think what we got to try to do is, you know, lean into the platforms, create content that makes sense on those platforms, and meet the audience where it is, whatever those platforms are. Someone's asking if you will be cover, covering the uh, efforts to colonize Mars. You know, uh, we have... Uh, <laughs> Maybe embedding some, <laughs> I some wish journalists. We, I wish we could do that. Um, about, I'm trying to remember, I think it was in November of last year, we had a cover story on Mars. We also had a television series on Mars. And often, what we try to do is work in concert with our partners on the television side, because there is such a clutter of information out there. Um, if we can you know, lean into what they're covering on television, or if they can lean into what we're doing on the magazine, we can kind of cut through. And so we've done that on Mars, and we have actually looked at the efforts to colonize Mars. One of the things that we're gonna be, you know, we've covered the race to the moon. Uh, we've got a big year coming up for space coverage because um, I think it's, uh, July of 19 is the 50th anniversary of the landing of Apollo 11 on the surface of the moon. And so we're going to have a lot of space coverage coming up. That's another one of those topical things that you can anticipate. Who owns Nat Geo? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so we used to be part of the nonprofit. We were owned by the nonprofit National Geographic Society. In November of 2015, 73% of all of the media assets and all of the Nat Geo businesses, our trips business, our licensing business, our product business, was purchased by 21st Century Fox. So we're 73% owned by 21st Century Fox and 27% owned by the nonprofit National Geographic Society. Now, very shortly, uh, assuming everything goes as planned, we will be owned 73% by Disney because we're part of that Disney-Fox deal. And so uh, Disney will step into where Fox was. So that is a, the complicated answer to what should be a simple question. And uh, we'd also like to know if those owners exert any uh, edit editorial influence. Actually, they haven't, and they have been incredibly supportive. Right after the, uh, the Fox deal went down, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of hollering um, because, you know, 21st Century Fox is a big global media company. It's a media powerhouse. They produce shows like The Simpsons and make movies like 12 Years a Slave. It's, it's just an amazing company. And they're, and, but the problem is, is when people hear 21st Century Fox, the only thing they really hear is Fox News. And so, you know, I got a lot of people writing me letters and saying, so are you going to print the climate deniers issue and stuff like that. So uh, no, they, they have been incredibly supportive. And the only question that uh, James Murdoch, who is the son of Rupert Murdoch and who is on our board, ever asked me about specific content was, Susan, why can't we do more stories about why people don't believe in science? So they've been incredibly helpful, and I think I'm looking forward to a really positive relationship with the, with the Disney ownership as well. So someone would like you to talk a little bit more about how you stay apolitical while addressing critical human and societal conditions. Well, look, I mean, we all have feelings, and we all care about the things that we cover. Um, and, you know, is it apolitical to Maybe some people would think it's political to think that women and girls should have, you know, 
human rights, basic human rights all over the world. Or maybe somebody would think it's political that we think that there's a plastic crisis and we want to encourage our readers and viewers and fans to, to stop using as much single-use plastic. I don't actually think those things are political. Uh, I, I don't think it's that hard to be apolitical. For example, let's look at the EPA. So we had an EPA secretary who got into all kinds of scrapes and trouble and political problems before he had to resign. So that was a story that was going to be covered, the political part, by the Times and the Post and CNN and ABC. That's not our story. But when the EPA, because of the policies, rolls back clean air laws and that starts affecting the environment, that's where we come in and that's the story that we're going to cover. I think there's plenty of people covering the peer politics. I want to cover the impact of the policies that come out of the politics, but not the politics. So someone is asking, how do you think Nat Geo has changed traditional cultures? What is the impact in places like Uganda, Mongolia, and Bhutan? Hmm. I don't know really the answer to that, and I don't know even if we have. Um, you know, we just had one of our photographers come back from the Amazon, and our October cover is on these little contacted tribes in Peru and in Brazil that are so, so threatened. And he, the photographer who went, you know, was a, happens to be a six foot four white guy. And I asked him, I said, how do you go and just sort of blend into the woodwork, Charlie? I mean, <laughs> how, you know, you, it seems like you would be a disruptive force. You, you just aren't fitting in. And he, you know, he made a good point. And he said, you know, when you set out to cover people who are, don't live with us or near us or have the same cultures that we have, you can either set out to show how different they are or you can set out to show how alike we are. And he said, I set out to show how alike we are. People laugh at the same things. They, you know, they have the same kinds of human bonds with each other. And when I looked at the pictures that he came back with, he captured the humanity of these people so well, and there was none of the sort of stereotypical, you know, guy in loincloth with spear, right? It just, I mean, that is not going to be the kind of photography that we're going to do about people from other cultures. And I think it's got to be all about capturing their humanity. And he said that after he was there for a few days and, you know, eating meals with them and just being around them and going hunting with them and swimming with them and fishing with them and uh, they have this wonderful, wonderful tradition where they, they all have turtles and they take their turtles down to the river and they wash their turtles and he was in there washing their turtles. He said after a while people actually did forget that he was there, which I think is quite a feat. I think that's a great place to end it. <laughs> Susan Goldberg. Thank you.